Hey, this is Warren Redlich. I want to show you an interview that was done with Gwen Shotwell. Gwen Shotwell is the president and chief operating officer of SpaceX. It's stunning to me. This video has been on YouTube for a month or more, and it has less than 4,000 views. I think this video gives us real insight into what's going on at SpaceX. So let's check it out. I'm going to cut out a lot of the video, the interview just to get to the parts that are important. But Gwen Shotwell, it's more amazing than Pepper Potts. Let's check it out crazy things to really change the world. I'm Susie Schur, and I'm chair of our global financing group within Global Banking and Markets here. And I'm so happy to be sitting here today with Gwen Shotwell. So if you're not familiar with Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs is a large investment bank, uh, what I would call a bank for very rich people. And they have these talks once in a while where they interview very prominent people. And I think this is the second time I've seen a video like this where they interviewed somebody and like no one saw it, which is stunning to me. Suji sure apparently knows when, as you watch the interview, you it, there may be, there are bits of the interview which may or may not be included where you can see that she met with Shotwell at, at SpaceX headquarters or former headquarters in Hawthorne before. Maybe it was Texas, I'm not sure. But she spent time with Shotwell before. They, they may be at least lose friends. Friendly interview, but great topic, great conversation. So let's dive in a little bit more. President and COO of SpaceX. Today we're gonna to talk about Gwen's leadership of SpaceX, the fast evolving world of space travel and commerce, and the latest technologies SpaceX and Starlink are using to revolutionize the industry. Gwen was inducted into the National Academy of Engineering and was also honored by the Rotary National Award for Space Achievement Foundation's 2023 National Space Trophy. She's done many more successful things in both her career and in the world of space travel, all of which we'll get to today. On a personal level, she is one of my idols, and I can't help but saying it, and I debated this with my kids, I'm over the moon to have her here. <laughs> now, just think about how she started off this interview. Very, very positive, very flattering to Gwen Shotwell. And if you watched it, the Don Lemon interview with Elon Musk which basically started off insulting and never stopped being insulting. So I'm here, you know, as you know, I'm on the platform because you are, you say you're a free speech absolutist, right? And there are no conditions. Uh, yeah. You have an opportunity to talk to somebody who's a massive innovator, in this case, Gwen Shotwell, doing amazing things. Susie Schur said, well, let's let her know. I'm really impressed with who she is, what she does. Don Lemon starts off by saying, I didn't know you had a factory in Texas. I mean, literally like, I haven't bothered paying attention to anything you've done. I'm just going to interview and ask you a whole bunch of questions about stuff that doesn't matter that I think is important instead of actually engaging with potentially very interesting person I can learn something from and my audience can learn something from. And Suji sure takes a very different tack of, hey, I'm really impressed with what you do. Tell us more about it. Instead of gotcha questions, it's like, hey, tell us more. Let's learn from you. And this, that's why this is such a productive interview. And I want to stress, like, there's bits and pieces in here that if you haven't followed SpaceX closely, or even if you have, there's bits and pieces in here that you might have missed. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through those points. I have a personal question for you and also a professional one. Don't worry, it's not too personal. Let's start with a personal one. What got you inspired and interested in space? When did it hit you that this was where you wanted to focus your, your career? And again, I hate to keep bashing Don Lemon, but Don Lemon's personal questions were about Elon's use of mental health, uh, Elon's mental health issues and what drugs he takes for his mental health issues. When you're doing this, are you, are you sober when you do it? I, I, almost are always, yeah. under the influence of anything? Uh, no, I don't, I don't drink, I don't really, no, I, no. So you got no drink, no smoke, no nothing? I mean, you smoke pot with Rogan. I had one puff. Yeah. I think anyone who smokes pot can tell I don't know how to, how to smoke pot. But you've admitted that you've had, you have a ketamine prescription. Again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that for? Well, I mean, it's pretty private to ask somebody about a medical prescription, you know. And diving deeper into mental health issues. That was a deeply personal question that was completely inappropriate. Here, a very appropriate personal question about Quinn, which I think she's answered this stuff before, but just striking the style of interview really, really important to understand. This is like a valuable interview that you get interesting information rather than a gotcha interview. I'm still ticked off about Don Lemon, sorry. 
Actually, I was not a space nerd as a kid. I was a car nerd, so I should probably be working at Tesla. Um, but I kind of fell into this industry. I was uh, looking for a job after my bachelor's degree, and I ran into one of my former professors, and he was working in Los Angeles at the Aerospace Corporation. And so I interviewed and got the job there, but that was my first role in space, actually. What's a deeper understanding of the value of space transport and exploration you feel is missing in the public discourse? I mean, human nature is a nature of exploration, right? And going beyond what we know and um, searching for new ideals, learning new things. And space is this very unexplored, I mean, literally unexplored, regardless of the decades that we've put into space exploration. By percentage, it is unexplored. And I feel like we aren't human if we don't go seek out what there is to learn in space. And I think robotic exploration is great as precursor missions, but we need to get out to other planets and certainly out to other stars. In order, I mean, I think that's how you find out how, how we came to exist. What is our future going to be like? How can we save humanity? I think you have, those answers are in space. So this is a critical moment for me. And I, I've seen Gwen talk about this before, but if you didn't see her TED interview with Chris Anderson a few years ago, people think that like Elon's this crazy guy who's talking about crazy stuff. And you're going to hear again in this interview, he's not alone. The team is on board. This isn't just about going to the moon. This isn't just about going to Mars. This is about going to other stars. And if you don't understand, let me be clear. Going to other stars is like way, like going to Mars is hard. Going to other stars is like a thousand times as hard as going to Mars, if not worse. The distance that has to be traveled in order to go to even the closest star is so much farther than the distance to get to Mars. It's, it's mind boggling how much challenge that's going to be. And Elon actually posted about this recently. Um, what, what's it going to take or some of the hints of what's going to happen to get us to other stars. And that's going to take decades to get to the point where we even try. But this is a company that thinks that far in advance. And it's not just Elon. This is the thing. The team is on board with the mission. When you hear people criticizing Tesla or SpaceX and blaming Elon, you've got to understand the teams, he's a team builder, Gwyn's a team builder. They build teams. The teams are on board. They are excited about the mission. And the mission is even bigger than you think it is. Right now, space is a destination for satellites and large government efforts involving science and exploration. But let's spin this forward, say 10 years or 20 years. What will we be seeing in regard to space that we don't see today? Is it tourism? Is it hypersonic travel? Something else that I, I haven't asked about? I think it's those things and more. I think we probably will land humans on the surface of Mars in roughly a decade. Uh, we certainly should launch humans and land them on the surface of the moon in less than that. Um, and we're working on that program with NASA. It's called the Artemis program. By the way, Artemis is the sister of Apollo, so very appropriate. Quickly, for people who don't get that, Artemis and Apollo are Greek gods in Greek mythology. So in the Greek mythology, Artemis and Apollo are brother and sister. Apollo was the missions to the moon. So now Artemis' mission is to go back to the moon, the sister of Apollo going back to the moon. And again, you know, Gwyn hitting on timelines, like we're going to be having humans on the surface of Mars in about a decade, and we're going to be on the moon earlier than that. You know, it's not just Elon. Like the team is on board. When, when, when you hear Elon say something and you don't hear the team saying it, you know, maybe it's just Elon. But when the team is saying these things, it carries a lot more weight. They're more serious about it. Certainly there will be, I believe there will be a permanent presence on the moon and we will just start building a settlement uh, on Mars. And then I think it's really important to take what you've learned in, take what we have collectively learned in those really insane endeavors and figure out how we go to the next star system. Again, audacious goals. It's not like we, we think it's about Mars. They're thinking like as far ahead as it is to think about landing humans on Mars, they're already thinking about going to other stars. They're, they're, the team at SpaceX is so forward thinking. They have such big ideas and it's not just ideas. 
they are working on it. They have plans. They don't know how they're going to do everything, but they envision a really amazing spacefaring future for humanity. And so many people don't get it. How do you think about progress at SpaceX and projects like Starship when dealing with exponentially higher degrees of complexity? Starship, I talked about going to the moon and going to Mars and hopefully going beyond. Starship is the vehicle that will take us there. And it will be an evolutionary vehicle, right? The Falcon 9 is our kind of workhorse rocket that we're flying. Uh, we'll fly roughly 100 times this year. Hopefully we fly 144 times next year. Um, and the what we learned in the Falcon program, uh, for those of you that don't know, rockets generally are single use. First of all, rockets are expensive, and to toss them after one flight seems horrifying. The technology leap that we had at SpaceX was reuse, and we reused the first stage of the Falcon 9 rocket. Starship, the evolution is we will reuse both the first and the second stage, so the entire vehicle stack will go on its mission and will come back to the launch pad much like an aircraft, we like to land very near the launch pad, if not on the launch pad, refill the rocket with the propellant, and relaunch again, same day, within hours. Um, our flight rate at roughly 100 this year far surpasses like nation's uh, flight rate. Um, in fact, I think we will end up putting about 100 million tons of satellite uh, and cargo into orbit, and the rest of the world uh, will put roughly 10% of that. Just really quick, I think she got her number wrong. I don't think SpaceX is putting up 100 million tons into orbit this year. I don't know if it's 100,000 tons. I think it, I, I don't think, I think Falcon 9 is capable of, you know, I, I don't know what number she, maybe it's 100,000 kilograms, it's 100 tons. I don't know exactly. I think she just got like way off base with that number. But um, again, the audacious goals and I think the key point in there was that Starship is an evolutionary rocket. Falcon 9 is the workhorse. So Falcon 9 is pretty much baked. They, they know what it can do. They're doing what it can do. And it's going to continue to succeed and, and, and deliver more payloads to orbit. Starship is under development and they're evolving it. And there's been hints of it. Elon has dropped hints of a, a not too distant future. Starship will be 20 to 30 meters taller and it will be able to deliver larger payloads into orbit. And there may be some other rocket engines involved. And The new Leet engine or something, if we're going to build that, do we have enough materials ready to order? In the Walt Mosker biography, Gwyn never talks about this. As far as I know, Elon's never talked about it. There's an engine they've been working on called Leet. It's 1337 upside down. For some reason, there's some computer geek speak where 1337 means lead, and I don't understand it, but it's some evolution in the rocket engine that I think is coming for Starship at some point. And then Elon dropped a post not that long ago about being able to go to other stars and there will be a much larger and more advanced version of Starship coming. So there's a lot of really cool stuff happening. I'm hoping we get Elon to answer some of this stuff, but it's really cool to hear Gwen talking about that also. Reusing both the first stage and the second stage is critical to move humans to other planets. And let me give you a little explanation of why. If you don't reuse the spacecraft, the trip is one way. And though we might want to launch some of our neighbors to Mars <laughs> on a one-way trip, in order to facilitate a settlement on Mars and true human exploration, you want to drop folks off, you want to bring the asset back, you want to take more people. Um, and, and if you happen to land on Mars, and not love it, some people might not love living on Mars, then they are going to want to come back. So just a couple of points here. One of the things I love about Gwen is she's so visually expressive. She speaks so well. If you ever watch Elon speak, Elon's filled with ums and uhs and pauses. And Gwen just has this natural style of speaking that's just much more eloquent. I love Elon. Don't get me wrong. I just think that, you know, in some ways she's a better communicator. And that's actually going to come up later in the interview. And that idea that I, I do want to know, like, how do her neighbors feel about that joke? Like, was she talking about particular neighbors that she's not happy with? Has she been having issues at home with the neighbors? I know Rand Paul, the senator, had an issue with the neighbors. I mean, every once in a while, there's issues with neighbors. I just kind of wonder, like, where did that come from? And is there somebody out there who's like, mm. but that was it's fun. And she's just she's just so engaging. Uh, it's such a nice uh, refresher 
compared to some of the other people here talking all the time. And I wish we got to hear more of Gwen. I remember first understanding the reusability thing and that like you were the only ones doing it. So keep right. keep going because, you know, we all think about, oh, there's a whole bunch of different space companies. No, there, there, there's nobody like SpaceX and this is this is at the 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 core. So and others educated. are trying and they will eventually get there, but it took us quite a long time to be able to get reuse working and, and operational. So benefits of reuse more than not one way trips to Mars and the moon. Um, when you send your rocket on a mission and you bring it back, you get to examine it. How did it fare during the, the, the mission? Are there cracks in the hull? Are the engines wearing faster than we thought? So you can actually improve the design, make it more reliable for people. And since we were founded to take people to other planets, this is really a critical feature. I think that's an important point that I have not heard a lot. Um, and you see this to some extent with Tesla as well. They talk about how they're able to, when a car is in a crash, if they have Tesla insurance, they get to see like how the vehicles handle a crash and how they can re-engineer the vehicles. And Gwen is talking about after they recover a, a booster from launch, they're able to see, okay, how did that perform? And if you haven't been following SpaceX, you may not know this, but there have been dramatic improvements in performance of Falcon 9 rocket system from the early days to today, where I think they're flying Block 5. I'm not even sure if they're still on Block 5. Just because every time they land, they can look at them and inspect and say, how is it doing? You can figure out how you can make it better, improve reuse, reduce the amount of refurbishment you need to do. And, you know, originally Falcon 9 was they were hoping to get 10 reuses out of a booster. I think the, the top booster had 19 reuses, and I think they just had one with its 17th reuse. And if you're able to reuse the booster many, many times, then you're reducing the cost of the capital of that booster across many, many missions, and you're reducing your cost of delivering payloads to orbit. It's a big deal. We're with a group of folks that care deeply about the finances. Uh, reusing the rocket is enormously beneficial to the bottom line, you can imagine. A rocket costs roughly what it costs an airplane uh, to build, roughly, you know, orders of magnitude. Um, and if you toss that airplane after one flight, you can imagine we would not be flying around the world. Society would be very different, and the airline industry would be in far worse shape than it is. Um, same with the rocket industry. You reuse those assets, it makes the bottom line far greater. So it's a reliability feature, it's a financial feature, and if you want to talk about the environment, I think, you know, rocket hulls falling back to Earth um, and, you know, really polluting the oceans is not a great, it's not a great look either. So we want to bring our assets back, refurbish them, refly them. And in the case of Starship, no refurbishment. Just like an aircraft, land on the pad, refill, and fly again within an hour would be great. My guess it would be a few. Again, you know, that outsized goal. We want to land on the pad and refill in an hour and go again. That, if you think about the, the missions that they're hoping Starship can achieve, if you're able to fly the rocket multiple times a day, you're able to get a lot more payloads into orbit, or you're able to carry a lot more people from one place to another on Earth for one of the missions that they're envisioning Starship for. So it's a game changer in terms of cost, because if you're able to do a high volume of missions for the same ship, you're spreading the capital cost of the rocket across many flights. You've got this crew that runs the launch pad and runs launch operations, and if they only do one launch every two weeks, you're not getting a lot out of them. You're paying them full time and their, their work product isn't that great. If you're able to systematize things and get it down, you may get 100x the launch volume for the same amount of work uh, of crew working the, the launch pad, the, the, the launch operations. So there's a lot of gain here to reduce the cost of getting payloads to orbit. It used to be about $10,000 a kilogram to get a payload to low Earth, low Earth orbit. With Falcon 9, they're probably around $1,000 a kilogram. I think they may have got it lower than that, but it's in the, the ballpark of $1,000 a kilogram, so a 10x improvement. But their goal for Starship is $20 a kilogram, which is 150th, and maybe even $10 a kilogram, which gets you down to 1 one one hundredth of the current Falcon 9 and 1 1,000th one of what it used to cost. It's just a game changer for being able to do things in space, whether it's going to the moon, going to Mars, launching satellite networks, um, there's so you know so many different things that you might be able to achieve when you have a much much lower cost of getting payloads to orbit. Not only that, but the the focus in building satellites has often been on reducing the weight of the satellite. Once you've dramatically lowered the cost of getting payloads to orbit, then the shift 
in satellite development becomes less about mass and more about getting more out of your satellite. You know, you, you don't have to worry too much about using extremely lightweight materials if the cost of getting that material into orbit is much less. So there's a, it's a game changer in so many ways. Let's pivot a little bit. Your background's in engineering. You're running a company that's well over $100 billion. How was that transition for you from builder, from engineer, from you know car geek turned space geek to business leader? Moving into business, and by the way, I still try to keep my tentacles in engineering because I, I'm kind of at core an engineer. I don't get to do much engineering. I maybe analyzing proposals is maybe as much engineering as I get to do. I'm a collaborator, team builder, and one of the things that I find in, with engineers is it's the inter, in engineering, it's the interface between engineering groups, between engineers themselves, where failures and issues really manifest themselves. And so I feel like I'm a people engineer. Engineering groups, engineering inter, you know, interpersonal, engineering back and forth. So that's my engineering. I think this is an important thing that I would say I didn't even know about Gwen and the way she sees her job. And she, she'll talk about this again a little later in the interview, but her job is to enable these brilliant people who work at SpaceX to get more done, to, to solve organizational problems, to get, get problems out of the way so highly productive engineers can be highly productive and not get dragged down by other crap that gets in their way. And, and she's a people engineer. She engineers how the teams work how the operations work so that the people can get the most, they can get the most out of the people and the people can feel that they're accomplishing more. It's like, if you work for a company like SpaceX, you can see that your accomplishments actually matter. Where when you work with other companies, maybe I, I have a friend who, uh, a couple of friends who work in a defense contractor, space contractor, or whatever. And like one of them's job is to run interference for the other guy, the other guy. Guy number one is super productive and guy number two, like part of his job is to keep people out of guy number one's way because guy number one is the super productive guy. And you, and you want to have your super productive employees be super productive, not bog them down in meetings and paperwork and crap. Running a, a company of engineers, you know, you must have tremendous credibility given that you are an it's, engineer. It's helpful, actually, but it's incredibly helpful with customers, especially when you're launching a new technology. Customers have lots of technical questions. And if you're like, well, I don't know, let me go find that answer, I'm not sure, you kind of build some doubt in the minds of customers. But being able to respond immediately to their questions or their concerns, I think, is helpful to close the deal. Gee, I wonder why Elon hired her. Like, this is a dream. Right. This is a dream. This is who you want doing her job at SpaceX. She's able to communicate with customers when they have an engineering question because she's an engineer, because she at least keeps in touch with the engineering. When there's an engineering question from a customer, which is often government or large corporations that are launching large satellites, whatever, she's actually able to say, yeah, I think we can do that. You know, I understand. Here's, here's how it works. She has enough of an understanding of the engineering to be able to answer that. And I think she probably downplayed a little bit the extent to which she really does understand the engineering that they do and you know what what involvement she has in the engineering. So you're the company's best salesperson as well. I think it is my that is probably my greatest contribution to the company. I want to talk about Starlink a little, which as we know or I hope you know is a global network of more than 5,000 satellites that provide internet access around the world. This is a massive opportunity to increase access to the internet net, which we know is key to addressing societal inequalities in education and living standards. How big a challenge is it to get more connectivity to more people? And where is SpaceX slash Tar Starlink on that journey? So we are very early in our journey with Starlink. We've got a uh, little over 2 million customers right now. I think we'll get to two and a half by the end of the year. 2 million customers, if they're paying $1,000 a year, that's $2 billion a year in revenue, $2.5 billion a year revenue run rate by the end of the year. I think they're actually spending on average more than that. But if it's $1,000 a year, because it's, like it's over $100 a month in the United States, and I think a lot of the customers in the United States and Europe, which is probably similarly priced, I think there are places like the Philippines where the prices are lower. But if the bulk of the customers are in wealthy Western countries paying over $100 a month, then on average, you're probably talking about $1,000 a year and you've got a 
two, two and a half billion dollar a year revenue stream coming. And there are some specialized customers that pay more. I think the airlines and cruise ships pay a much higher rate. It's a big operation and it's growing fast. To connect anybody on the planet that wants to be connected, maybe even those that don't know they should be connected and help connect them as well. Um, our first customers, we, we really wanted to kind of help. And so some of our first customers were indigenous people and communities, schools, Chile, we connected a school in Chile. I was uh, in the Amazon last fall um, and we brought a Starlink terminal to a school and to a neighborhood that had never had connectivity. Super cool, it was like one of my favorite days at SpaceX, I still have the photo on my phone. This school had about 80 kids from little, little tinies to high school and I got hugs from all of them. Uh, we connected to Elon, we actually did a video a call with Elon to this school of students and it was really amazing. There are probably 100 or 150 customers of rockets on the planet, you know, but there's 8 billion potential customers for Starlink and so the connective tissue between what we're doing on Starlink and the employees at SpaceX and kind of connecting to the human race, is, it's just much more direct. Number one, 8 billion potential customers. You gotta love Gwyn's ambition there. Number two, again, I gotta harp on Don Lemon. Look at the story she just told. Like, Don Lemon and anybody who interviews Elon, frankly, there's so many people who interview Elon and they go for these gotcha questions. Like, that story is a spectacular story. Nobody says, hey, Elon, tell me a story about some incident where SpaceX connected somebody with Starlink and how that mattered. Like, Gwyn gets those questions and Gwyn really hits them out of the park. For some reason, when these media people go out get Elon, it's like instead of getting positive stories from Elon, it's always gotcha, gotcha nonsense. And I just love the way Gwyn told that story. And of course, you know, Elon participated in this connecting this, you know, remote school and the Amazon, or I think I don't know if Chile has that much of the Amazon. I'm not actually sure where this was, but and I may be exposing my ignorance about Chile, just to be clear. But anyway, I thought that was really special story and, and a great example of the great stuff that Starlink is doing, that SpaceX is doing, that matters for humanity on the planet. People complain, oh, you know, the billionaire wants to launch people to Mars and launch people into space or whatever, and they're playing billionaire games. It's like, well, here's something that the billionaire's company is doing that matters for people on Earth, making life better for people on Earth. That's the kind of story you would get if you ask the right questions. If you ask positive questions, you get positive answers. If you just play gotcha games, you don't learn very much and you miss out on the great things that are happening. I mean, we think we're doing cool things for humanity with rockets and Starship and, you know, putting people on the surface of the moon and, and putting people on Mars and hopefully further, but connecting with individuals and getting hugs from little kids because they've never seen, they've never been connected to the outside world before is pretty amazing. When the war in Ukraine first started, you know, you, you all have been instrumental to rescue and recovery efforts around the world, whether it's war or natural disaster. Can you t give us a couple little examples of that? Maybe you want to talk about, um, talk about Ukraine. And it, we, we, had, we would have been talking to SpaceX about helping them connect with some NGOs. We thought we'd, you know, Goldman were clever. We're going to connect them with some NGOs to uh, help them get terminals to, to places in natural, na na natural disaster and war. And, um, and the SpaceX team said, you know, NGOs take four to six months. Let me tell you the story about what happened when the war be broke out in Ukraine. I love that story if you're comfortable telling it. So first of all, if you're not familiar, NGOs are non-governmental organizations. They're like groups that are trying to help. Red Cross is a really good example of a non-governmental organization. And they try to help in certain ways. But the point was NGOs work slow and SpaceX works fast. So check out the story that Gwyn tells. So um, we had been, I mean, we all kind of knew there were tensions growing in, in Ukraine and we were working quite hard with the regulator in Ukraine. Like, come on, please give us permission to operate Starlink. We think it will be enormously helpful um, for your fight for freedom, which we all kind of knew was, was gonna happen. Um, and, you know, regulators are a conservative group of folks and it takes months, sometimes years to get permission to operate in a country. I just had to jump in here a little bit. I don't think this part of the story has been told, that SpaceX was trying to get Starlink to be licensed to operate in Ukraine before the war broke out, and the regulators in Ukraine wouldn't let them. And I think she's way too nice about this, that 
many countries create bureaucratic hurdles for Starlink to be able to operate. And they'll tell you the story that this is for safety or this is reliability or blah, blah, blah. And it's all BS. Starlink works. It's been approved in many countries. We know it's safe. Why are you holding it up? And the real reason that they're holding it up is because there are entrenched business interests that run internet service already or cable operators or whatever it is. They don't want the competition. And they have more influence over the regulators than the people who benefit from having the added competition and the better service provided. And so, and she's going to talk more about the regulatory hurdles that they face. But think about that. They wanted to get Starlinks into Ukraine before the war started. And the regu- you know, why weren't the regulators letting them in? What was the problem? And you know, the problem was that there was some, because let's be honest, Ukraine probably isn't the, le- the least corrupt country in the world. There's probably a fair degree of corruption in Ukraine. Not, we have it in the United States. We have it everywhere. But maybe there's some corruption there. And there's some company that's providing internet access. And they don't want SpaceX to compete with them. Right? They don't want these Starlinks coming in and offering a great service at a lower cost. Right? Because it destroys their business. And they're the ones who have influence over the Ukrainian government, the Ukrainian regulatory. And I'm not just singling out Ukraine. This is true around the world. But the irony that you'll, you'll see coming is like all of a sudden, oh, hey, we want this. Oh, oh, okay. Now you want it. Okay. And SpaceX doesn't hold a grudge. Um, and anyhow, you know, Russia invaded and then we got a. Sorry, and really quick, we all knew it was coming. So what Gwyn is saying is when everybody knew the war was about to start, the regulators were still keeping Starlink out. I don't know. I don't remember that I knew that the war was coming. So I guess Gwyn, you know, had more information about this. I mean, there was I know there were hints of it happening. I didn't know how, how, how likely it was to happen. But she believed it was going to happen, and the regulator still held it up. Tweet. I think it was tweet at that time. It was not an ex post um, from the regulator in Ukraine saying, let's have Starlink. So we took that as our, um, our legal license to go ahead and operate in Ukraine. And we had terminals there two days later. We had terminals there two days later. NGO, four to six months. SpaceX, two days. They got the go ahead. They had Starlinks in Ukraine in two days. This is what, this is the value that, and I don't, this isn't just SpaceX. This is the value that an Elon Musk company delivers is they move fast. They deliver, you know, once they have a technology ready, it takes them time to get things working sometimes, but when they have a technology ready, they move fast. And I think it was really a game changer because their, their comm system had gone down. They were using a uh, geo, geosynchronous uh, uh, capability, which is much easier to target. Again, we, we now see there was an existing satellite provider or satellite providers in Ukraine that probably didn't want the competition from Starlink. And if you're not familiar with geosynchronous, geosynchronous is something like, I'm making up numbers, but something like 25,000 miles above the Earth's surface. I might be wrong about that, but it's in the ballpark of 25,000 miles where the Starlink satellites are like a few hundred miles above the Earth's surface, maybe even 200 miles or less above the Earth's surface. So the, the communication is much, the latency, the amount of time it takes for your signal to get to the internet and back is much, much shorter because of the speed of light and all that. So there's a lot of uh, a gain from having Starlink there. But, you know, and, and the other thing is that the, the geosynchronous satellite was easier for the Russians to knock out that capability. It's harder to knock out Starlink because there's so many satellites and the terminals are small and the terminals are spread out. And so their system went down and Starlink was there within days uh, operating and, and helping out. Um, and so it's evolved. There's 70,000 or more terminals in Ukraine right now. I think it's really been a game changer for their, their fight for freedom. This young workforce, this energized workforce, this workforce that you know works 24-7, um, and, and, and is developing the future of space travel and communications. What are the main attributes you and the team and Elon look for when, when you're hiring? And do you hire mostly out of undergrad? Are you looking for grad students? We'd love to hear a little bit about the culture of SpaceX. So first of all, they're not working 24-7. But in my experience visiting Starbase and talking to some people who work there, I think 12-hour days, six or seven days a week are not unusual. Nobody works 24-7 because you'd pass out. 
right? But but it is, I think, commonplace to work at least 12 hour days, six or seven days a week, uh, depending on what they're doing. Um, and I, I personally talked to a contractor who works 12 hour days, seven days a week. This is an outside contractor who's doing construction work on the on the on the base. And I talked to a SpaceX employee, and I'm pretty sure he was working more than 12 hours a day. I don't think he's working more than seven days a week, but it, it felt like it. And just totally driven by mission. And I, and I think this is a really interesting answer from Gwyn. The, the questioner tried to sort of direct the question a certain way, and Gwyn just totally turns it around and gives like a way better answer than I think the questioner even thought she was going to get. I think the most important characteristics for a successful, there's three for a successful employee at SpaceX. First of all, you have to have kind of raw, innate intelligence. You don't have to necessarily be skilled in an area because smart people will learn, right? And there's a lot of people that already have skills at SpaceX that they can learn from as well. So raw intelligence and motivation, incredibly important. We really want self-starters. We want every employee to act like a CEO of the company. Um, and find issues and go solve issues, even if it's not within their, you know, their swim lane, so to speak. And then the other, so there's two. And the third is, if you've had success somewhere else, you will likely have success at SpaceX. And so we ask questions during interviews, like, tell me about a thing that you did really well. Tell me about a project that you were really successful with. Elon has talked about your resume at the top of the resume. You should have examples of, of excellence in your work in the past. And that was, I think, that third point show me where you've done something amazing before. And that's an indicator that you're appropriate to be working at one of my companies. Same thing with SpaceX or Tesla, like show a history of excellence. That's one of the big things they want to see. And you notice she didn't touch undergrad, master's degree, PhD. She didn't touch that education stuff at all. They don't care about that. Are you good? At, are you smart? Are you motivated? And do you have a history of success? That's the SpaceX hiring criteria. That's the Tesla hiring criteria. They're not, they don't care whether you have a PhD or what your educational background is. I mean, it probably matters a little, but that's not on the top of the priority list. Was what? I was not interested in engineering as oh, a high school okay, student. okay, got it. Because I, I didn't know what an engineer was. My mother was an artist. My father was a, a neurologist, a physician. And I had no idea what an engineer was. In fact, the only thing I knew about engineers, like, you, there were engineers on a train. You know, like, mm -hmm, that's what an engineer is. Is this a true story? Your mom took you to a panel at the Society of Women Engineers. That is true. And you met a mechanical engineer who inspired you. My mom did drag me as an ornery teenager, very ornery teenager, to a Society of Women Engineers event at the Illinois Institute of Technology. I grew up in a little town north of Chicago. So on a Saturday, she took me down to IIT. Again, I was like, why am I going to this dumb thing, right? And there was a panel of engineers. There was a chemical engineer, a mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, and one other, and I don't remember. Um, but the mechanical engineer was doing, from my perspective, the most interesting work. She was very well-spoken, and she was by far the best dressed. So I'm like, I want to be her. <laughs> so you picked out your role model. How old were you? I think I was 15. Wow. I can't even believe you went, like trying to get my 14-year-old to go to a thing on a Saturday to yeah. listen to a bunch of engineers. I know, I can't believe I went either, but thank goodness, you, right? You probably weren't as ornery as you remember yourself I, being. I think it was pretty ornery. We'll talk about that later. Uh, they don't talk about that later. And I think this is something that we all want to know. What does she mean by ornery? What was that? If you watch the, the, her interview with Ted, with Chris Anderson at TED, I think she touches on that stuff a little bit more. Um, the, the, the history of going to this event, I think it was actually a little bit more depth than that one. Um, and I, may, if I, I don't remember exactly, but I think she may have shown a little more light on, on the ornery part. I don't know if she was just boy crazy, if there was something else, but there was something uh, that she talked about and hinted at there. I think we all want to know more. You know, it's just like a personal story, but it's kind of interesting. Like, well, all right, what was this teenage crazy girl like? You, you worked at several companies before you went to SpaceX. Chrysler, as you said, the Aerospace Corporation, Microcosm. What did you learn from them? So it's interesting. All three of the companies that I worked for prior to SpaceX um, were very large. Well, with the exception of Microcosm, it was a small company, but it was still very bureaucratic. It was 100% kind of government um, contractor, full of bureaucracy and slow processes and painful, painful crap that you have to deal with every day just to get something done. And so for sure, the thing that I wanted to shed and what really attracted me to SpaceX was this, 
this was going to be a very innovative environment with as little bureaucracy as possible. And that really excited me. I really wanted to go try doing this crazy thing. And the crazy thing was, like I interviewed with Elon, and he says, well, we're going to build ships and put people on the surface of Mars. You know, now it seems normal to me. I don't know. Does it seem normal to you? Is that like part of your normal thinking? No, not. No one. All right, well, it's normal to me now. It will be normal to you in 10 years. I just love the way she's interacting with the audience. Oh, that's not normal to you now? It will be, trust me. It's coming. You'll all be used to this soon. Like, you know, some people now take for granted that we land orbital rocket boosters. Some people don't even know we land orbital rocket boosters, but some people take it for granted. Well, of course we land orbital rocket boosters. No, that was really, really hard. And I just love the way she addresses that. It was Abby Normal uh, 21 years ago when I interviewed with Elon. So people may not get that. Abby Normal, Abnormal. That's a joke from, uh, I think, the Mel Brooks movie, uh, Frankenstein, Frankenstein Jr. I forget exactly the name of the movie. It's a Gene Wilder movie. The Abby Normal is a joke from that movie. Would you mind telling me whose brain I did put in? Abby someone. Abby someone. Abby who? Abby Normal. Abby Normal. I'm almost sure that was the name. And I thought, this is crazy. But I thought, if, if SpaceX can't be successful, then the industry that I was in at the time, it was the aerospace industry, it will be no fun. Like, I don't want to work in this industry anymore. I'd rather be a barista, frankly, or sell real estate. I think this really hits at an important point. I, I've talked to friends who are in engineering, like, well, why don't you apply to work for SpaceX? Well, SpaceX doesn't pay enough, right? I, I'm making too much money in my current job. But there are people who are really motivated by mission. They're really motivated by getting results, by accomplishing things. And if you're motivated by those things, then SpaceX is the place to go. Tesla is the place to go. If you just want a secure paycheck and you want a comfortable job, and you, don't have to, you don't want to work too many hours. And so they naturally attract the people who are really motivated by wish, mission and willing to sacrifice to achieve that mission. And that's actually, by the way, I think that SpaceX actually hires a lot of veterans because what do veterans do? Veterans work long hours to pursue a mission that's really important right? And they commit to their mission. And I, I don't think anybody's ever talked about the extent to which Tesla and SpaceX tend to hire veterans. But I think this is actually a big deal. If you think about it, what do veterans, what do soldiers do? Soldiers work long hours at difficult jobs to pursue a mission that they view as important. And that's what SpaceX does. That's what Tesla does. They are pursuing important missions and they need people who are willing to commit to doing really hard things and putting a lot of time into it to get it done. Because it just was so stodgy, uninspiring. I use the term constipated. And you really need to get away from that and do crazy things to really change the world. You need to do crazy, innovative things to change the world. What company are you supporting? What company are you excited about? I'm excited about a company that's doing really innovative things to change the world. Gwen delivers that story, she delivers that mission. That's a critical thing to have on your company, on your team. If your job is to sell sugar water, right? That's the, the Steve Jobs, John Scully bit. You want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? Like, do you want to change the world? Right? And, and Gwen wants to change the world. And the people who come to work at SpaceX are people who want to change the world. They want to make life better for humanity. They want to take humanity into space. People at Tesla want to change the world. They want to like make the world cleaner. They want to make the world more efficient. They want to reduce the cost of transportation. They want to accelerate the transition to sustainable energy. All that. There's a lot of great. They want to make increase the probability that the future is good. That's the kind of people that get attracted to people who are willing to work really, really hard to achieve really, really difficult missions that are really inspiring. And I think that Gwyn delivered that really well. And so then the next day, his assistant called to ask if you'd be interested in interviewing for this VP for BizDev uh, job. Biz dev, business development, which is basically sales, developing customers who are willing to spend money to buy their services or our products. Biz dev. Can you tell us a little bit more about like that first conversation you had? What were your first impressions of him? And why, do you, why did he decide to seek you out and, and like, of all the people he might seek out for this really important role? You'll have to ask him. <laughs> but the interview, I don't remember everything about the interview, which is a little 
odd because I tend to remember, have, have odd uh, kind of keen memories. Um, I do recall, because um, I was in the industry and you hear a little bit about what's, what Elon Musk, at that time you didn't even hear SpaceX, but what Elon Musk is doing in space. And I really felt like what he was trying to do needed a better storyteller or a storyteller. Um, and, and I, you know, I think I said, look, I, I really think you need to tell this story more broadly and maybe slightly different ways because I wanted to see SpaceX succeed. And maybe he saw that I was quite interested in, you know, in, in helping with that, telling that story um, and bringing in customers. So, yeah. When you made the move, you know, because you'd already had, uh, you know, a good portion of a good career, did it feel risky to you? Very risky. Yeah, it must felt have. very risky. But I don't think people really succeed in life without taking some risks, actually. Um, and though it was, I wasn't looking for a job, but I had a couple other job offers at the time, same time I was chatting with Elon. That was by far the riskiest thing, but it was by far the most exciting thing. My gut was saying, you got to do that, you got to do that, you got to do that. Did you back, go back and forth I, for a I while? did. Yeah. I, I was such an idiot. Yeah, I was dithering for probably like a month. I think it was about a month. Um, and then I finally, I was driving, uh, driving on the freeways in LA and I called him. I'm like, I've been such an idiot. Yes, I want the job. And he laughed. I remember he laughed. That's funny. Yeah. I'm sure uh, he probably knew what the answer was. Did he give you the space to figure it out though? He did. Okay. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about your, your day to day? And, you know, now you spend most of your time in Texas. You know, you said you're the chief salesperson, but you still seem to interview people. But, like, how, how does your day or your week look? And how do, you, how, do you, how do you think about organizing that? My day never looks like what I anticipate the day to look like. I mean, my job is really to solve problems that people that work at the company um, for me or for Elon couldn't solve themselves, right? That's what we're, it's either that or clearing the chaff from the folks that work for us getting rid of friction and chaff so that they can do great work, focus doing great work instead of doing annoying crap. That's what I was talking about earlier, that you know, what does she see her job as? Her job is to enable the brilliant people, brilliant, motivated, hardworking people at SpaceX to give them the opportunity to, to do great things, to get the stuff that's getting in their way out of their way so they can do great things. And I think that's a brilliant motivation, a brilliant way of thinking for a leader. It's one of the reasons why she's such a great leader of that company. I, uh, I live in Texas, but I think I'm probably on the road more. So I do spend a lot of time in Washington, D.C., spend a lot of time overseas with customers or stakeholders, all with the goal of building the business, continuing to build the business, and ensuring that at least knowing what are the hurdles that are a few years out and seeing if we can't kind of slowly break through um, I, I do think going to Mars as a, a private company, um, I do think that will be bureaucratically difficult to do. Mm -hmm. Technically a challenge, of course, but I think there will be lots of bureaucracy that pops up um, that will make it hard to get there. Um, and so I feel like we need to start working on that. That's an absolutely brilliant moment. And I, honestly, I did not think about that point, that if we want to launch Starship and send people to Mars, like there's technical hurdles, but there's also bureaucratic hurdles. And she's thinking years ahead, what do I need to do to clear the path for us to be able to do these great things and getting the bureaucrats either solving the concerns bureaucrats have or getting the bureaucracy out of the way so we can achieve these great things. Again, like brilliant. I, one thing I was interested in is I think that Gwen lived in California, Los Angeles before, and at some point she moved to Texas, and I never heard that before that she moved to Texas. I do believe SpaceX headquarters is now in Texas. And it was never asked, and I'd be curious, you know, about, not that it's matters for SpaceX or whatever, or for the technology side, but I am curious how she felt about leaving California, moving to Texas. Um, you know, how, how was that for her? And that's not a question that was asked. I would have loved if that question was asked. Where, where are you on uh, Starship right now? So we had, you had the one launch. We had the one launch. Yeah, just to be clear, I believe this is before IFT2. My, my understanding is that this interview was in January of 2024, and it, it was published on YouTube in February of 2024. I'm not sure that that's correct. I think given what she says here, it may have been before IFT2. So I'm not... I'm a little fuzzy on, on the timing. Um, extraordinary launch, by the way. Um, and we've got the vehicle at the pad. 
and we're waiting for final regulatory approval to launch. Before we launch, we will have the Flight 3 ship uh, and booster ready to fly. Um, in fact, Flight 4 is not far behind. So I think what you'll find is we are waiting for the regulatory organizations to, to catch up and, and let us fly. And I do think that that is one of the things that will hold back um, innovation, certainly in this space, is the regulatory organizations. And by the way, they are not bad people, and they are working very hard, and it's a pretty thankless job. Um, on the other hand, they are not set up to move the pace of innovation. And if you want to innovate, we have to, certainly in this country and in plenty of others, we have to figure out a way to get the regulatory system to move at that pace. So first of all, optimism that, you know, IFT3 is ready and IFT4 is behind it. You know, they're, 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 they're good to go. And, and Elon has talked about that. Others have talked about NASA space flight, you know, Tim Dodd, whatever, the, Scott Manley, the people who watch what's going on with SpaceX, they've talked about how there's, they're lining up ready to go. And I believe there was recently something from the FAA that they're working on improving this, uh, their speed of being able to approve these launches. And we are, these are not bad people. This is their job to make sure that what we're doing is safe. Um, we had the user terminals, you know, the dishes for Starlink. We had the first version one of the terminal approved by the FCC. Version two was in the FCC approval process. We were ready to start selling version three. So we got version one out in the wild selling it. Version two, we're trying to get approvals to sell. We're ready to sell version three. And version three was less expensive for us to build, which the FCC wanted because they wanted us to lower our prices, but we couldn't get that system out to sell because it needed to be checked and verified and made sure it was safe. Um, and so like that's a small example. It was certainly not the biggest hurdle that we had, but it's a, an easy example to digest to say that in the United States, for sure, uh, we need to address this regulatory, the speed of regulation. So this is one of the things that Elon talks about, that regulations never die. And Gwyn is, you know, a perfect example. The FCC, FCC wants SpaceX to lower the cost of Starlink. And Starlink's like, well, we have this lower cost terminal that will enable us to lower prices, but you haven't approved it yet. You haven't approved the previous one yet. You have to ask yourself the question, why is it so difficult? And is there anybody who's in politics who's motivated to solve these problems? Because it's not just that, like if you had a member of Congress who said, this is my mission to, to hack back regulations. You know, unfortunately, there's a lot of people in Congress who think it's their job to make sure these regulations are in place. And I suspect that some of these regulations are in place to reduce competition for established providers of internet access, whatever. They don't want a company that's innovating fast to out innovate them and obsolete their products and services. Right. And, and they have influence. And this is one of the problems with big government, big government. There's something called regulatory capture. Look it up. It's I'm sure it's on Wikipedia. Um, she is super diplomatic and not saying that's what's going on at all. But that is a big part of it is regulatory capture. I think it was uh, maybe it was Brad Gerstner, uh, Brad Gurley, something like that, gave a talk about the regulatory, how regulations are slowing everything up, too. And it's like we have the potential to make life a lot better for everyone on the planet. And the biggest hurdle about making life better for people is government, not just the U.S. government, governments all around the world, state governments as well, local governments. There's all kinds of hurdles, and, and these governments exist to make it hard to make life better for people. People want to tell you that government's there to, to make everything safe. And Gwyn is really, really diplomatic about it, but that's not why they're there. They're there to protect incumbents. They're there to protect special interests who are busy lobbying regulatory agencies to say, no, don't make it easier for them. And unfortunately, I don't see any champion in Congress who's really working on changing that, or any other country for that matter. Maybe Argentina, maybe there's hope in Argentina. And when you put the terminals globally, do you have to deal with regulators in all the different countries? Every country. The terminals? Some so countries have up to seven or eight different licenses that must be obtained before you can service a terminal. So think about that. What does SpaceX want to do? SpaceX want to make it easier for the people of that country 
to get internet access at lower cost and higher quality, especially for people who are remote and don't have access to wired internet. And what do the, what, how is the government set up? The government is set up to make it as hard as possible. And if you believe that that's done to make life better for people, then you're, frankly, you're just not, you're overly optimistic about government. It is done to protect established industry businesses that are making money off of people who would much rather save money and get better quality. And, and this is, it's around the world. It's, I, like I pick on the United States government. This is true of governments around the world. And you, know, you just heard it from Gwen. Eight licenses to get a Starlink terminal to operate. Like, why is it so complicated? You know why it's so complicated. And if you are a big believer in government, you just don't want to believe the reality of why this happens. This happens because of big government. Big government is not there to make life better for you and me. Big government is there to enrich and protect the powerful. You have said, if you're not looking forward towards the future or trying to improve the current technology, you'll be left behind. Why is that? And how can companies make the most of that advice? So we do have a relentless focus at SpaceX on doing better on the next cycle. And it's not just the next rocket design needs to be better. It's when you do that thing, that small thing, tomorrow, do it better, do it faster, do it more efficiently. Um, we just have this culture of speed. And if you can't do it better the next time, you're probably not doing it the same because something else occurred and got in your way. You're probably going slower. And so that's, that was what I was trying to convey in that statement, that if you're not going faster and doing better, you're probably doing worse. Certainly, it, it, com competition is a great way to look at this as well. If we don't obsolete, because we're quite successful, if we don't obsolete our own products, some smart business person is going to figure out a way to obsolete my product. And I'd rather obsolete my own than have them obsolete it for me. That is a classic business lesson I've heard multiple times before. I think it was, um, I think it's, is it Gordon Moore, Only the Paranoid Survive? Um, there's a lot, you know, you want to you wanna make your products better. And if you Osborne yourself, if you obsolete your own product, that's better than somebody else doing it. And, and a lot of people don't get this. And so same thing with Tesla, right? The next generation vehicle platform is coming and it may obsolete something. If you ask me, the Model Y has mostly obsoleted the Model X. Now the Model X is still better than a lot of other vehicles out there, so they still sell some. But if you're thinking about buying a Tesla SUV, you'd probably choose the Model Y over the Model X unless you want some really special features. Yeah, Falcon wing doors or the insane acceleration of plaid or whatever, or just a little bit of extra size. Um, if you want seven passengers or six or seven passengers, you want a Model X over a Model Y. And did Model 3 really, in a way, obsolete Model S? Right? And so they're probably working on a new Model S and X so that they can come up with something that's not as obsolete as, you know, Model S and X are old now. Right? They're still, as far as I'm concerned, they're still the best large sedan and large SUV on the market, but they could be better. And they're, I'm sure they're working on it. And you see the same thing with SpaceX. All right, Falcon 9's great, but we got to make Starship, and Starship is eventually going to obsolete Falcon 9. And if we don't do it, then Blue Origin might do it, or uh, Rocket Lab might do it, or somebody else might do it. So we better be working our butts off to make something better than what we have. I love that focus on it. if what you're doing, if you're not doing better and faster today than you were yesterday, you're probably doing worse. That I'd never heard that one before. I think that's brilliant. So how do you keep those two parts of your culture going? On the one hand, you hire all these brilliant young people to do what you want them to do, right? To, you know, they're building Starship, they're building rockets, they're launching satellites, and yet you want them to have a little bit of time and room to like daydream for you in a sense and make the next thing happen. How, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do you have those two things going on at the same time? Like following the the Gwyn Shotwell agenda, and then- Or the also, Elon Musk or, agenda. Well, I mean, I'm just giving you full credit right now. You, you do have to run it day to day. And then also innovating. So you can innovate a new thing, or you can innovate what you're doing and do it better and faster. And we certainly expect employees to do that. But candidly, like our employees are more enthusiastic about our mission and our vision than, than me. 
and I, I know I should be the most enthusiastic on the planet, but you know, you get dragged down in day to day, and again, I'm trying to take all the crap off of people's desks, you know, but man, these employees come to work and they love what they do and they work really hard, they're self-motivated, they're very excited about the mission. And they want to do it better. They want to make sure their part uh, or their process or their test is better tomorrow than it was today. So that's basically the end of the interview. And I just want to say again, like, I hope Don Lemon watches this video, not, not my takedown of the video, my, my breakdown of the video, but watching the original video and say, this is what you could be doing. This is the kind of interview you could have done. You had the opportunity to have a great interview with Elon Musk and learn something and you just threw it away. And this woman uh, ex explored, which it was only 30 minutes long. There was so much content in this interview. It was brilliant. And I think we learned so much and I'm so excited. And I want to stress that point that the, the team is super excited about the mission. This is, I think, one of Elon Musk's greatest skills is team building. He builds great teams. The Tesla team is a great team. The SpaceX team is a great team. The Neuralink team is now doing even more amazing things. They're a great team. Boring companies, you know, and, and I think this is an X, what they're doing at X is amazing. XAI is doing some pretty cool stuff. The, the details just came out about Grok. And I think the secret, and I don't, I'm not saying I understand all of it. One of the critical things is you start with an insane mission. And you sell that mission. It's it's almost impossible, but it's doable. And you get people who are willing to to buy it and say, "Hey, this mission is worth pursuing." And you've got a leader who is demonstrating, "I will do amazing things, and I will work my butt off to get there." And so you set. He's a great role model. He he works. I think he said he works sixteen hour days, right? So if you work fourteen hour days, you're doing pretty good, right? And he so he insane mission. He gets people to buy into that mission. They get so passionate about the mission, they believe in it more than Gwen, right? She's a great team builder as well. You hire great team builders and you build great teams and the teams do great things. I, there's this criticism of Elon that, oh, he just, he just hires great people and they do great things. Like, well, why, doesn't, why hasn't, rocket, why hasn't uh, Blue Origin put a rocket in orbit yet? At the time that they both started, Bezos had more money than Elon. Bezos could hire great people. Bezos probably did hire great people, but somehow, he didn't sell them on the mission. He didn't build the right teams, whatever's going on. And, and he probably doesn't demonstrate the leadership that Elon demonstrates. So the idea that Elon just has a lot of money and hires great people, well, there's lots of people with lots of money who aren't doing these amazing things, right? So there's things that Elon's doing that aren't appreciated. And, and give Gwyn credit that when pushed on her agenda, she's like, well, maybe it's Elon's agenda, right? She knows who the leader is. She respects Elon. This is, you know, and again, like, Who's leading SpaceX besides Elon? A woman. People are calling Elon, you know, sexist, racist, whatever. It's like, well, who's in charge of SpaceX? Who's in charge of X? Linda Yaccarino. He's not afraid to hire a woman if she's really good at what she does. And you can see from this interview, wow, she looks like she's really good at what she does. So you appreciate, you hire great people, you give them a great mission, and you support them, and you get stuff out of their way so they can do great things. Um, absolutely genius. This is the way it should be. This is why the brightest people, the top engineering students want to work for SpaceX and Tesla, because that's the kind of organization and you're actually able to accomplish great things and you'll work your ass off for it. And at some point you'll burn out, but you'll look back and say, that's the best stuff I've ever done in my life. And it's, yeah, read, read the, it's in the Walt Rosberg biography. He talks about this as well. This, you know, challenge of working like crazy hours to get crazy things done. And it does burn some people out. And then some of them regret leaving and come back because it's just so awesome. So uh, love Gwen Shotwell, really thrilled to have her leading SpaceX. Uh, love Elon, of course, love SpaceX. I love everything that Elon's companies do and, and, and uh, what SpaceX is doing is fantastic. And a great interview by this woman from Goldman Sachs, absolutely spectacular. And I'm stunned that this, this interview has less than 4,000 views. Um, I hopefully, I actually think more people will watch my inter my video breaking down this interview then actually watch the interview we'll see how it turns out thanks everybody so much for watching check out the t-shirts at elonbits.com please check out my other videos support me uh here as a youtube channel member or here as an ex subscriber uh, as a patreon supporter or on the daily lie uh thank you so much for watching